approaching the lowest point in his time on earth. Jesus is concerned about comforting those whom he loves. What a great blessing it is to be one of his children, and we're going to talk about that today. Well, welcome back into the Sawyer's home for another Bible study in the Gospel of John. We are glad you have joined us. Lots of Bible studies out there online, and we're thankful and honored that you have chosen to be a part of this one. Uh, those of you who have not had gone through all of the Gospel of John with us so far, all of the same places that you found this study, you can find all of the previous studies from the Gospel of John, the Bear Valley Church of Christ YouTube channel, the Bear Valley Church of Christ Facebook page, the Bear Valley Bible Institute Facebook page, my Facebook page. In fact, if you're watching us on YouTube, if you'll stick out to the very end, then uh, we'll put up some links so you can find very easily all of these Bible studies. We're glad you're here. Hope you're having a great Lord's Day. We hope that you are uh, have got your Bibles out and some pens and ready to mark. In John chapter 14, and verse 1, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So see, he knows that they're upset. So that's why he's telling them these things. When you get down to verse 27, Jesus is going to tell them again. So you get these bookends in verse 1 and verse 27. Of, Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is really wanting to comfort them in this time. He's wanting them to not be trouble. He, he says the way to overcome that, that worry or that stress, which is always the case, is to trust or to believe. You believe in God, believe also in me, because you're good Jewish men. You, you would believe in God the Father. There are certain attributes and characteristics of God the Father that you would accept and know. Well, remember, that's why I came. All the way back in John chapter 1, he had said that's, that was his purpose in coming is that he was going to show the Father to them. He was going to, to be the one to explain the Father. He, he's, the things he's teaching, the things he's saying come from the Father. The way he acts shows the Father. And so just like you trust God the Father, you can believe in me. You can trust in me. Why? Because Jesus is God. And that's what throughout this gospel, John has been trying to show us is that Jesus is God, and more than that, why that we need and and uh, ought to turn to Him, believe in Him, trust in Him, and follow Him. Verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? You know, the, the idea you've probably heard before in other translations, uh, my Father's house are many mansions. Well, the, the word here literally means spacious rooms. But the point of what he's trying to get across here is that there's plenty of room. Don't worry about the fact that you, it, it's not that you're not getting to come with me. It's not, not that you're not getting to go uh, be with me in that place at this time because there's just not room for you. It's, it's just a matter of timing, as we talked about on Friday night. But there's plenty of room for you and for everyone else. Because God wants everyone to be saved. There's going to be plenty of room in that place. Uh, and then he asked this rhetorical question. If, if it were not so, and I love the way the ESV translates this, uh, as kind of a rhetorical question. Would I told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you if there was not enough room? Would I have built up your hopes to have pulled the carpet out from underneath you? Well, God wouldn't do that, and Jesus is God. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. See, that's why he's going and they cannot come, besides the fact that, that they've not uh, done their work. He is preparing for them. Now, keep in mind, this is a metaphorical writing to teach them about heaven. He's not, Jesus is not literally up there with, you know, three nails sticking out of his mouth and a hammer beating on a shingle saying, hold on, uh, Father, we're not ready to go get him yet because I hang out through building this house for them. But the idea here is, is very metaphorical, but some of the fundamental promises of the Christian faith are in this verse. 
And, and you compare that to what he told the unbelieving Jews in chapter 7 and chapter 8, that I'm going to a place that you can't go, that, uh, that where I'm going you don't know and you can't know. He's telling the disciples you can go. Now, in chapter 13, you can't go to the cross with me, but here he's talking about to that, that eternal home, being with the Lord forever in a place of reward. He says, I'm going to make sure that you have the ability to be there, and there's plenty of room, and I'm, I'm, I'm providing a path for you there because I want you there, and you can be there. Verse 4, uh, and you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? So you got these funny questions that go on and on through John just so he can give you the answers. Uh, you, you know the way of how I'm going to get there. And, and especially in this chapter, really all throughout this whole conversation in, in verses or in chapters 13 through 17, you have the apostles asking questions because they're not getting it. Okay, but... They want to get it, and that's why they ask questions. Disciples ask questions. Disciples keep on trying to learn, keep on trying to follow. As disciples, we need to make sure we're asking questions, that we're trying to make sure that it, it that, that we can arrange it on. Now, they're not going to be able to get it all arranged in their head until after the resurrection. John has pointed that out several times, but they're trying is the point here. And, and so... Thomas says, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the road to the Father's house, so you've got to follow Jesus. Now, when you get over into Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 22, those who are followers of Jesus, Christianity was called the way. And there's no more exclusive statement made about Jesus than what you'll find right here. That I'm the only way to eternal reward. I'm the only way to God the Father. I'm the only way you can get there. I'm not just a prophet. I'm not just a rabbi. I'm not just a teacher. I'm not just a good man. Even some today would try to say that. Uh, in the news this past week was a, uh, a famous newscaster that was saying that Jesus said didn't say he was perfect. He admitted that he didn't live a perfect life. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the exclusive way for you to get to God the Father, for you to have eternal life. I'm the only way. That's the claim of the Bible in its totality. That's the claim of the Gospel of John. No other man, no other prophet, no other religion. That's why over and over again in the New Testament, the, these prophets and apostles are going to say, if anybody teaches you anything other than Jesus, let him be accursed. Even if it's an angel from heaven, and we've got religions near us where they say, well, an angel from heaven brought us this message. Well, let him be accursed because only Jesus only the gospel that he's given is the way to get to the Father. He's also the truth. Back in chapter 8, verses 31 through 32, and then moving forward into chapter 17 and verse 17, the word is the truth, little w, and the word big W is the truth. And then he says, I'm the life. Now, over in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, in 1 John chapter 5 and 11, John is going to reiterate this point when he says, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Verse 12, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. And then over in chapter 17 of the Gospel of John, verse 3, he's going to talk about what that eternal life is again. That's this relationship with God the Father, relationship with the Son. There's lots of verses in John that we've already talked about, about Jesus being the life. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And why is he saying all this? He's saying it because he's wanting to comfort these disciples, wanting to comfort these 11 that are with him. Verse 7, Jesus continues and says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Well, you go all the way back to chapter 1, verse 18 again, and we're told by John that that was the reason he came to the earth, was to explain, to show us the Father. And the only way to the Father, and the only way to see the Father, is Jesus. 
Uh, again, the disciples are so upset. They're trying to figure all this out. And, and Jesus is saying that, that you, you claim to know the Father. If you know me, you know the Father. If you know the Father, you know me. Well, it, it's a package deal. Uh, and and now you have a better you should have a better understanding of the Father because you've spent so much time with me, because you've seen the things that I've done, you've heard the things that I've taught, you've been with me, so it's like you've been with the Father. Well, notice in verse eight what Philip says. Philip says to him, "Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us." Jesus said to him, "Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me." has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus is, seems to be a little bit upset by that question. Uh, it, not upset like I'm mad at you, Philip, for asking it, but it, it's it's kind of a hurtful thing. It's just one of those where you really aren't getting this, are you? How can you say, you've been with me all this time, Philip, and you, you can't say that you know the Father? You've seen all the things that I've done. You've heard me talk about the things that I teach came from the Father. The things that I do come from the Father. And yet you say you don't know the Father. You want to, well, just show us that one more thing. Just give us that one more evidence. And we do that sometimes even today. But again, they're troubled. They're upset. And, and isn't it comforting to know that even when we're upset, when we don't understand when we're confused, when we're hurt, when we're wrong, Jesus doesn't give up on us. And he keeps trying to work with them to help them understand who he is. Verse 10, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. See, we've talked about this already. Works is the same things as sign. We saw that in John chapter 9. We saw that in John chapter 5. The works are the signs John 20, 30 through 31 tells us were so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that belief would allow us to have eternal life. Uh, each one of them has, has a meaning, has a, uh, a context that, that we've tried to, as we go through them, show and explain uh, what, what it means when it says that, that, uh, that Jesus you know, cleansed the temple. What was the meaning behind that? Well, he's the one that builds his body, builds the temple, his body, the church. Uh, what did it mean whenever he said that he's the one that made him well? What does it mean when he said that he was the good shepherd? What did it mean when he said he was the one that was the light of the world? All of these signs, the healing of the blind man, the healing of the lame man, um, the um, uh, all of them have, have these deeper kind of punchlines, we've called them at times, it helps us to see. The point is, is that if we don't see him as the true one, if we don't see him as the bread, if we don't see him as the living water, if we don't see him as the one who sent, then we're going to miss what the big picture is from John 20, 30 through 31. We miss a lot more, though, if we don't see them individually and see all these characteristics about him, see what it is that, that makes him God and makes him someone that we need. Verse 12, we have another one of those truly, truly, amen, amen statements from Jesus. I, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Because I'm going to the Father. There's the stage of apostolic ministry that wouldn't begin until Jesus went away. Well, you, if you connect this verse over to chapter 16 and verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Greater things. Lots of, lots of different discussions about what the greater things that the apostles are going to do. But think about it from the perspective that the apostles were, Jesus was doing signs so that people would just believe in him. When the apostles are going to go out and do signs and do wonders, and again, remember, this is, 
13 through 17, he's talking to the apostles. We're not doing miracles today. And that's a different study for a different time. But when they're doing signs, when they're doing miracles, when they're doing the things that they're doing, they're doing it so that people can actually come into the body of Christ, so that they can be one of God's children, so that they can be part of the those that are joint heirs with Jesus. And so the, it's kind of like when, when Jesus said that in Matthew that there was not a um, a greater man that ever walked earth than John the Baptist, and yet everyone in the kingdom was greater than he. Why? Because they were in a in a special, unique relationship. We're in a special, as members of the Lord's church, as member of the body of Christ, we're in a special relationship in a, a, a special dispensation that John didn't get to be in, John the Baptizer. And, and what makes their work, it's not that, that they're going to one-up him. It's not like that, you know, they're going to say, well, you know, Jesus did some good things, but have you heard what Peter's doing? You know, he's broken all of Jesus' records. You know, that's not the kind of thing that what he's talking about. What makes it greater is the significance of what they're doing. Verses 13 and 14, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So here we go again. Another one of those verses in these these chapters that are uh, quite often taken out of context, especially with the prosperity gospel kind of people that all you got to do is name it and claim it. Uh, You ask God for it and he'll give you, but that is not what he's saying. They're going to do greater things, but not until he goes back to the Father. What he's talking about is like in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, whenever the lame man is healed and he's healed by Peter in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, In Acts chapter 9 and verse 34 is another example. When they call on him in their ministry, They're going to do greater things. Remember chapter 1, uh, verse 50 and 51, when Nathaniel was so amazed that Jesus could tell him that he was underneath that tree. And and, uh, he said, you think that's something. You're going to see greater things than this. You're going to see greater things because when you get to the point that for my glory, verse 13, that the Father may be glorified through the Son. When you get to a point where you're saying, we need to be able to do this or to do that, in order that uh, God's name might be glorified through Jesus, in order that we can help people to see their necessity of coming to God through Jesus, you're going to be able to do it. Now, they can't just say, hey, I want to I, I want to uh, have a new car. I want to have a new chariot in their days. Think about the times that the apostles asked God something that they didn't get. You think Peter wanted to be put in prison? Do you think that James wanted to be put to death? Do you think that that Paul wanted that thorn in the flesh? He said, I went to him three times and asked him to take it away. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. This is not a, a free car to get whatever you want. This is not your dad giving you a credit card and saying, spend whatever you want to spend. This is your, the apostles are going to be able to do things to bring glory to him. So again, he's trying to comfort them that as you go through this process, as you uh, go into doing the work that, that you're going to be doing, there's going to be some great things that you can do. But it's all about, as he says there in verse 13, that the Father may be glorified. So it's when they are in an obedient relationship with him when they're doing the things they're supposed to be what a comfort to know that when you're in that obedient relationship with him he's with you you get into verse 15 and he goes on a little bit further with this if you love me you will keep my commandments now in a world where so often people in the religious world don't want to talk about obedience don't want to talk about uh, things that we ought to do jesus wasn't afraid to talk about that was he Here's a personal challenge to the apostles. Verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now this applies to us, again, because 1 John tells us that it applies to us. See, they're all upset, they're tore up, they're looking at each other, wondering who it is that's going to betray him. And Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So what commandments are, is he talking about? Well, the commandments like in, in John 15 where he's going to tell them that they are to bear much fruit. 
Like in John 16, when he's going to tell them that, that they're supposed to preach uh, about him. Take this saving message to the world. Obedience is what separates the men from the boys. That's the point that he's making here with these apostles that John is going to make in 1 John for us, that this is the dividing line of whether we're really his or not. But let me tell you, that all the way back to John chapter 3, that being born from above, being born again, if there's not a change in our lives then something's wrong. We hadn't really encountered Jesus. We hadn't really come to Jesus because obedience is equated with love. In John chapter 3, verses 16 and 36, obedience was equated with faith, with belief. Verse 16, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever. Jesus was a helper. He was a comforter. He was a counselor. He was an advocate. In some English translations, translate the word that's uh, translated helper here as, as one of those uh, that's used. Jesus was a helper. He was a comforter. He was a counselor. He was an advocate. However, it's translated in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a helper. We have a counselor. We have a lawyer. Jesus is going away and God the Father is going to send another like him, but in order for him to come, that, that other helper, then Jesus has to go away. Again, go back to chapter 7 and verse 39. I'm going to give it to you. Now, who's he talking to here? He's talking to the 11 apostles. And this helper is going to be with them forever. It's signif That's significant because Jesus is going away. It's also significant to notice what he says here. I'm going to ask the Father. This helper is going to come because I'm going to ask for him to be sent to you. Jesus cares that much. So verse 17, even the, father, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. The unique thing about God, uh, John's gospel is that he connects the spirit and the truth. He emphasizes the fact that uh, the spirit is going to reveal truth to the apostles. You see that in chapter 16, verses 12 through 13. Remember several, how several times in the gospel of John that Jesus says the things he's, he's saying, the things he's speaking is not his own stuff, but they're the things that God told him. Well, the, the apostles will not be speaking their own stuff, but what God reveals that through them by the Spirit. The world can't see it. The world can't understand it. You know because Jesus is with you. You know because Jesus is with them and the Spirit is with them. The world won't receive the Spirit. They won't receive Jesus. You saw that back in chapter 1 and verse 12. And Jesus says, I'm going to leave. I'm going to come to you in the presence of the Holy Spirit because there is a, a helper like him. Kind of like in the Great Commission, and lo, I'm with you always even to the end of the work. Specifically, though, he's talking here to the apostles. He's not going to leave them alone. Verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I may be wrong, but in context, it seems like when he says, I come to you, he's talking about coming to them in the presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't think he's talking about the second coming like he is in verse 3. Uh, some will say that it's the post-resurrection appearance is what he's talking about here. But uh, either way, again, he's trying to comfort them by saying, because you are my children, you're obedient, you've shown your love to me, and I'm not going to leave you like orphans. I'm going to come to you. Verse 19, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will also live. This is because his bodily presence will not be in the world. You know, you go back to John chapter 6 and verse 40. He said that the will of the Father was that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. We're going to behold Him, and He says that you will see Me because I live, you'll also live. We're going to, we can behold Him now in our hearts through the eyes of faith, but one day we're going to look on Him again. Verse 20, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Well, is Christ in us? That's what the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, and in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, and in Ephesians chapter 3. 
Christ dwells within us. There's lots of ways that Christ is in us, but the Spirit is the part of the Godhead who manifests His presence in us, and, and that's what He's telling the apostles here. Verse 21, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself in him. Again, notice how many times that He talks about obedience. He wants them to do what He tells them. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them. There's a symbiotic relationship between God, Jesus, and the apostles. Um, later on, he discusses that loving him means loving his commandments, it means keeping his commandments. And, uh, and on and on, he's going to talk about this throughout this text. Verse 22, now we've got one of the apostles again, one of the disciples uh, asking a question. This is Judas, and John gives us this parenthetical statement to help us realize we're not talking about Iscariot because Judas Iscariot has already left the building. This is a different, the other Judas. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. They thought he was going to to, uh, to be the king of Israel. So how is it that you're going to be the king of Israel? You're going to show yourself to us, but not to the rest of the world. But the way he's going to show himself to them was through the coming of the Holy Spirit. 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In this section, he's talking a lot about if you love me. Well, all that goes back to John chapter 8, verses 31 through 32. Jesus said to the Jews who have believed him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. It explains what this means throughout this, that if you're truly his disciples, you're going to be keeping his words. They weren't truly his disciples because they didn't want to keep his words. But he said, telling the 11, you are my disciples. But you only are if you're going to keep my word. Verse 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Remember who he's talking to. Some say, well, this is what the Holy Spirit's going to do for us. This is what the Holy Spirit will do for the apostles. How did the apostles write Jesus' word. Well, Jesus spoke God's word. That's what he said in chapter 7. That's what he said in chapter 3. Jesus spoke God's word. The apostles wrote them because the Holy Spirit brought the, all of these things to their remembrance. That's why we could not do it without the apostles. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, he can tell that they're not happy. He can tell that they're upset because he's going away. And I'm telling you all of this to tell you that you, to try to comfort you. I love you, and you show me you love me when you keep my commandments. You show me you're one of my disciples and you keep my commandments. If you're keeping my commandments, if you're one of mine, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to send the helper. So don't think about that. I'm just going to leave you out on, on your own and you won't have any kind of help. I'm sending a, another helper like me. Verse 28, you heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father for the Father is greater than I. How's he going to come to them? Again, verse 16, verse 17, verse 18, verse 26, the Holy Spirit is how he's going to come to them. It's a good thing that he's going to the Father. It's a good thing. It's troubling and it's hurtful, but it's a good thing that he's going to the Father. Why is the Father greater than him? If Jesus is God, how is God the Father greater than him? Because remember, Jesus put Philippians chapter 2, he did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but put that off and put on the form of a servant. The likeness of man that he's in right now is what makes God the Father. He took that subservient role on his own, and that's why God the Father is greater than him. We sometimes get the idea that they're, you know, God the Father is the captain, God the Son is the the sergeant, and God the Spirit is the private. And that's not exactly the way the Godhead works. But nonetheless, uh, Jesus is is saying that it's good that I go. It's the best thing for you. 
Verse 29, and now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe like he's done so many other times in this gospel. I'm telling you ahead of time, this is what's going to happen because I don't want this to catch you off guard. I don't want you to think that I'm surprised. I want you to believe So I'm telling you ahead of time so that you don't think like some in the religious world even teach today that Jesus' death on the cross was, you know, that things didn't work out the way he wanted it to. And so there's going to be a plan B. He's going to come back later on and try to establish an earthly kingdom. That's not what the the case at all. This, This didn't catch Jesus by surprise. Jesus knew all this was going to happen. And I want you to know before any of this happens, this is exactly the plan that needs to happen. And so that you can believe. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. John 12, 31, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. That's Satan. And he's fixing to be attacked by Satan with everything Satan has. Satan is going to try to, to, to stop what Jesus is trying to build because Satan, like the apostles, like, like all of, of mankind, like the angels, you know, Peter talks about that they're, they're peering in trying to figure out what's going on and what, what this is all about. Satan thinks if he stops Jesus, he's going to stop the whole thing. He's going to win. And he's going to throw everything he can at Jesus to get Jesus uh, to, to stop Going forward, he's going to have him put to death, and and he think that's actually what needs to happen, but Satan didn't know that at the time. Verse thirty one. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from him. So God says you have to die, and so he's going to die. The time is here. We've seen that chapter thirteen, chapter Jesus recognizes all through the book. My time is not yet come. My time is not yet come. Now chapter twelve and thirteen, the time is at hand. The time is here, and I've got to do it. That's what I was sent for. Well, I asked for it to be taken away. So he says, rise, let's get up and get going. Now, they don't leave just yet. He's getting them ready to leave, but they don't really leave from that upper room until chapter 18 and verse 1 when it says after these things they left. Uh, it's kind of like when we say, you know, we're uh, and we're notorious. Don't invite us to your house because we're notorious about this. You know, it gets to be nine o'clock. Well, we need to be going. Yep, and and so we'll we'll talk a little bit more, and then nine fifteen. Well, we really need to be going, and we'll get our glasses and bring them to the kitchen, and and uh, we'll start talking a little bit more, and and then uh, well, we need to really be going. Nine thirty gets there, and we're we're starting to walk out the door, and we stop at the door, and we'll talk for another fifteen minutes at a quarter to ten. We walk out the door because we say, well, we need to be going, and then. You know, uh, we stand out in the driveway and talk for another 30 minutes. And finally, an hour and a half after we first said we need to go, we actually leave. Well, that's that's kind of what's going on here uh, with Jesus is that uh, he says we need to go, but they're going to keep talking for just a little bit through chapters 15 through 17. Jesus is trying to comfort his disciples. He's trying to help them see that as obedient children, that there are promises made to you that you don't have to be like orphans. You don't have to be left alone. You have uh, an opportunity to have God as your father. You get to be joint heirs with me. You have the the comforter, the helper that I'm going to send back to you that, that's going to be a helper like me. You, you're not alone. How comforting is it to know that in the darkest hours that he faced on this earth, Jesus was only thinking about the ones he loved so much. That even in our darkest hours, that Jesus is thinking about us because he loves us so much. And sometimes we want to we want to claim him as Lord when times get rough, but we don't want to really do what he says. If Jesus is our Lord, if we're really God's children, it means that we're obeying him, that we're doing the things that he tells us to do. And when we do that, then the love of God is seen in that we're obeying him and he's fulfilling those promises that he's given to his children. 
Jesus told the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And 1 John tells us that Jesus still is the way, and he's still the truth, and he's still the life. And the New Testament is full of teaching us that we can't come to the Father unless we go through him. Let's pray. Our Father, we're grateful for a beautiful Lord's Day, and we're grateful for the opportunities that we have to worship you and to study your word. Father, we are so thankful that Jesus was willing to come to this earth to put on uh, the, the servant role of a man, that he was willing to live a life here in humility, that he was willing to be obedient to the point of the cross to be put to death for us. We're thankful, Father, that he's provided us that way back to you, that sin separates us, that we choose to separate ourselves because of our sins, but Jesus provides a way back to us, back, back to you that Jesus is the truth and that following him, we don't have to question or wonder what it is that we're to do, what our purpose is and what our goal is, that Jesus is life, that because of him, we can have a relationship with you that begins here on this earth and goes through all eternity. That even, even though you know physically we're going to die, that because of Jesus, we can overcome death and live with you forever. Thank you for that hope. Thank you for that grace. And thank you for that love. Thank you for the comfort that we find in your word, knowing how much you love us and how much you care for us. Thank you for Jesus showing us that. And it's through him we pray. Amen. Well, again, we're glad that you have decided to be with us this evening. We hope that Wednesday night you will tune back into all of these same channels when Tyler King will be uh, continuing his study through the book of Daniel. That will be at 5 p.m. on Wednesday evening on the, the same places you found this, the social media places, the, the YouTube channel for the Bear Valley Church of Christ. We hope that you'll study with that. Tyler is doing such a great job. Uh, with uh, that book, he's uh, such a talented teacher and and uh, such a, has such a good heart. And what a blessing it is to get to study through the book of Daniel with a man like Tyler. We're thankful for that. Hope that you'll avail that study to uh, you and your family as well. We also hope you'll be making your plans to be back with us on Friday evening at 5 p.m. as we continue our study through John. And then again, Sunday evening at 5 p.m. Friday night, we're going to get into chapter 15 and look at about the first 12 verses about abiding in the joyful vine and what that means for the uh, disciples that Jesus is talking to in that upper room and some of the application that we can make uh, from that that they've taught even us and, uh, and, and how we follow Jesus and what we do as part of his family and, uh, and being God's children. So we hope that you'll be back with us Friday night at 5 p.m. Uh, hope that you'll be with Tyler Wednesday night at 5 p.m. We hope that you're staying safe and healthy through this most unusual time that we're going through. Uh, if there's some way that we can help you, uh, especially those of you that are members of the Bear Valley Congregation, please let us know. Uh, call the church office uh, comment, send a message through Facebook or uh, YouTube or whatnot. Let let us know. Reach out to one of the elders, one of the ministers. We'd be glad to to help you in any way we can. And maybe you're someone that that's just watching this. You're not a member even of the Bear Valley Congregation, but you want to know more about how that you can have Jesus as your Lord. You want to know more about what you need to do to follow Him. If you want to know more, if, you, if we can help you in that way, then let us know that as well. We'd love to study with you and talk with you about that. Most of all, we hope you remember that we love you and God does too. There were some that requested you be on here tonight. Hello, everybody. Glad you could join us in John class. There's within the heart of mother. <laughs> Click here for the playlist of all of these Bible studies from the Gospel of John. Click here and get the last Bible study from the Gospel of John. Click this round thing over here and you can subscribe to the Berry Valley YouTube channel. Have a great week.